turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, and would you stand with me as we read God's word this morning? I love the fact that uh, when you read in the book of Ezra, uh, when Ezra the, the scribe uh, read from the word, he had, had a little platform, I think is where the whole idea of a pulpit and all those things came from, they built him a little stand, and he stood up there and read, and then he and the other scribes gave the essence of what was taking place, and so uh, uh, that's a great tradition that I believe started probably there for us to stand to hear the reading of God's Word. So 1 Peter chapter 2, I'm going to read uh, verses 9 through 12, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. May the Lord add this blessing to the word. Father, we are thankful for your word this morning, because in that we find everything that our souls ever long for. We find who you are, to know you better, to walk with you, what you desire from us. We are so thankful, Father, for all the blessings that you have given us. and thankful that we have the opportunity to share together this morning around your word. I pray that you would bless it and may it be strength and nourishment to us. May it be food and drink that we might grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. Thank you for that. Give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. 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 Great to see you. Last week, uh, we began to get an overview of Peter's first epistle. Uh, it was written during a time of, uh, well, I, to say great distress is putting it mildly, because Nero was uh, tremendously persecuting the church at that time. Uh, those Christians that lived in that first century uh, suffered intense persecution. I shared a little bit with you of some of the things that they went through, but it was just horrific in terms of what they were going through. But Peter then wrote to them uh, something from Rome, something maybe literally from Babylon, or maybe Babylon was a code word for Rome. But he wrote to these Christians that were scattered in these various places that he mentions there in chapter 1. And so uh, Peter explained to them, and thankfully to us as well, that we have been born again into a living hope and have a living power and a lasting love as a result of what Jesus has done and how important that is to us. Then come, then, uh, that comes to us through the grace of God in our, in our salvation. Uh, in chapter 1, verse 13 through uh, chapter 2, verse 12, he talks about our sanctification. Those are some of the things that we dealt with last week in chapter, uh, in the first part of our message. Uh, and he talks about uh, our sanctification and our service and how important those particular things are. So what I'm trying to do is help us get an understanding of the overall picture of what Peter is, is dealing with here and what that means to the church at that time. Uh, they, as again, they were suffering tremendous persecution. They needed encouragement because of what they were going through, helping them to stand. We talked about this morning, as Brad shared together in our opening, about the foundation and how important that is. And that's the foundation that Peter is endeavoring to build in the life of these people during that time that were suffering persecution. Now, we don't particularly experience that right now, but it's coming. We see the signs of that happening all around us, where the, the church, Christians in particular, are going to suffer persecution because of their faith, because of trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see those things going on in this country. Other countries around the world have certainly seen it. People where, churches where, uh, uh, countries rather, where uh, there is not the freedom that we enjoy in this country or that we have enjoyed. But we see that shrinking more and more. And so the message that Peter is bringing to these Christians during that time is particularly becoming more and more applicable to you and I in the world that we are living in right now because there is an anti-God, anti-Jesus movement that among the echelon, the upper echelon, that is trying to suppress anything that has to do with true Christianity. Because why? Because those people that know the Lord have a freedom. We enjoy a, a hope that the world doesn't have without that. And so 
they want to uh, characterize us as they did the church in the first century as weird people, crazy people, have uh, un, uh, there's uncommon belief systems that, that don't line up with their idea about uh, having a God that we could worship, that we've invented, that what God that is coming from our own minds. And so that persecution is coming, and we see it taking place. So today, uh, we begin to get, I, I wanted to give us an even broader perspective on the balance of Peter's letter as we take a look now at chapters 3 through 5 and just give a, an overview of those and, and consider God's grace in submission. Uh, we talked about God's grace in salvation. Now we talk about it in our submission, God's grace in submission. I don't know about you, but I, I think submission today is a difficult co concept for a lot of people, don't you? Uh, we, we, are, we are fiercely independent. And uh, may I say that that's particularly true of us that here live here in Northeast Montana. I didn't get an amen on that, but it's nonetheless <laughs> true. And, and I think even Montanans in general have that. But it isn't just unique to us because we live in an area that is uh, environmentally not the most ideal, uh, but yet we are hardworking, all of those kinds of things that help us to be that. And, and, and in one sense, that's, that's really good, but it also touches us in an area that is difficult, and that's that area of submission. We don't want to submit, uh, remember not too long ago, not too far from here, there were these guys down there that were not going to submit to the government and all the standoff that took place around that, well, you know, that, that spirit, that idea, isn't just unique to those guys in that area of town, in that uh, area of Montana. It's a spirit that pervades the age. It's a spirit that was born out of uh, rebellion. It started way back, we could see it with Cain, because he didn't want to submit to the, obviously to the thing that God had laid down for he and Abel to do. Abel brought the, the sacrifice, of, uh, but Cain brought the, the fruits and vegetables. Now, he, it was, there were good fruit, good vegetables, all that kind of stuff, but it wasn't what God required. But we see that idea of not willing to submit, and we see it, we see it in early childhood, even in our, in our lives as, as people that have children, uh, kids that don't want to do what they're told to do, right? <laughs> Even adults who don't want to do what they're supposed to do. So we get this broad perspective. We see it evidenced, as I said, in King. Uh, and, and imagine this. Think about this for just a moment. The audacity that Cain expressed when God says, hey, where, where's your brother? And he says, am I my brother's keeper? Can you imagine? Can you put yourself there and say, here's God speaking to you. God spoke to you and said, where's your brother Cain? Am I my brother's keeper? Could you imagine yourself saying, I can't, I'm saying, I don't know, Lord, you know, I'm going to lie through my teeth because I don't want to say to God, but the audacity of King. Anyway, just the idea of submission that, that was there. And, and, and you can see that all the way through the history of Israel. Didn't they always have a problem of submitting to God? We, God laid down the Ten Commandments, the laws, all of those things, and they kept them for a while and they were blessed and then they drifted away and started not submitting to the will of God. Right up until the time of, that Jesus came, they wouldn't submit again. There it is, 300 plus prophecies concerning the coming of the Messiah, that they rejected him and wouldn't do it, even though he, he fulfilled every one of those prophecies, over 300 of them, to the letter, but yet they refused to do what? Submit. Submit. Right up even through the age that we are living in, right up until the time of the end, when it's very clear what they've said, when the, the hailstones and all the stuff is happening to them, the, 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 uh, the, the judgment of God falling upon the nations. They, they acknowledge this is God that does that. But what does it say in Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, 19, chapter 19, verse 1? And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. Isn't that amazing? They still would not do what? What's the word, church? Submit. submit. They would not submit, even in the face of all that's going on. They, boy, how hard does your heart have to be? But yet, that same spirit lives in you and me. We have a hard time submitting sometimes, don't we? I, I love watching, sometimes you see these the, the videos on the internet of the guy getting pulled over by the cop. And how he, how people will just stiffen. And instead of just saying, yes, sir, 
the guy talks about, yeah, well, this radar is, radar is independent. They've clocked barns doing 150 miles an hour, and they go through all kinds of crazy stuff rather than just do what? Submit. Submit. It's just in us. So from Genesis to Revelation, we see all the stubbornness of mankind and our unwillingness to submit to God and his laws. God has laid down his word, given us his word, so that we can live lives that are uh, full of glory, full of joy, unspeakable, full of glory. We talked a little bit about that last week. But yet, what do we do? We resist submitting to his word. So it's just so pervasive. So beginning now in chapter 2 of verse uh, uh, verse 11, Peter begins to talk about our submission on, on a number of levels that are really important to us. And, and, it's, and it's, we see these examples of, of Christ Jesus and, and this of what he has shown us to do in the midst of what the Bible calls a crooked and perverse generation. Does, does that, by addressing us in a very specific way, show us how we are to live? Well, that's what the Bible is there for. We see God's instructions in his word. We hear the word of God, and, and he shows us the things that we are to do. So in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, listen to what he says. Beloved, I beg you as soldiers and pilgrims abstain from flesh fleshly lust, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. So chapter, this verse, this passage that I just read, chapter 2 begins with the word therefore. So we need to know what it's there for. So he's talking to us about submission based on what has been said in his word. So here's what we are to do. God gives us grace to submit. And I don't know about you, but I need that grace to submit. I need God to help me to be willing to be willing, if you will. So we're going to talk about his grace and submission. And the first thing that he talks about is our formal obligations in chapter 2, verse 13 through verse 25. We are to submit as saints, first of all, in verses 13 through 17. Peter here is dealing with, I think, some really uh, uh, practical aspects of our lives. He is dealing with how we are to live our lives as citizens here on planet Earth. Here were these people living in the Roman Empire and under this awful persecution, and yet they lived up to certain obligations that they had that they believed were from the Lord. Take a look with me at chapter 2, verse 13, if you will. Therefore, he says, in light of what I've just said, verse 11 through and 12, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether of the king as supreme or to governors as those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is, listen, this is the will of God, that by doing good you may, be, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bond servants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Which king was he talking about at that point in time? Nero. The Nero, that Nero that drug people behind the chariots till they died, lit them, put them full of tar and lit them up to, guard, to light up his gardens. That's the Nero he was talking about. That Nero, we know, we don't, know uh, a lot about what is uh, the world that we live in experiences in terms of cruel government. We can we hear, we read magazine publications like Voice of the Martyrs and we see some of the things that's going on, but we don't know it in terms of practical experience. Too many times our freedom in this nation carries, I think it carries over to our spiritual life and we think we have the same rights as citizens of this country that we should have that same kind of rights as Christians. But what does God call us to do? To submit ourselves to give up our rights, to serve the Lord. And so not only are we to submit as subjects, and he talks about that, but we are also to submit as servants in verses 18 through 20. Not going to take time to read all of that right now because we're as we go along, we're going to get into that in, a more, in more detail. But the requirement that is there, and the reason for being subject is found in that 19th and 20th verse because it's commendable before God. What, why are we submitting to the authorities? Because it's commendable before God that we be good citizens of this country, right? Yes. Yes, amen. That's true. Thank you. It's, but, but is there a limit? Well, absolutely. Right up to the point where 
in, in uh, an example of taking a pinch of incense and putting it on the fire and saying, Caesar is Lord. Right up to the point that it's commanded of you and me to submit and say, I don't believe in the word of God. I will not. I, I, you have to submit to the rules of government. doesn't matter what your faith is. When it comes to that point, then we say, no, I won't do that. Caesar is not Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. And so at that point, we're probably going to experience some difficulties and some persecution. But that's the point of the whole thing. There is a limit. We submit up to that point to where it's going to violate the word of God. And we're commanded to do something that is against what the word of God says. At that point, what do we do? That's the point of resistance. We don't submit to that. Up to that point, we do it, right? Amen? Amen. That's a great word. We are submit as saints, secondly. Thirdly, we are to submit as saints. Because why? Because that's our calling. Verse 21, for to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. That's our calling, to be submissive, to be people that are different than the world around us. Because what do we see people in the world do? They resist. They don't want to submit to anything. We have this independent spirit. We want to do it ourselves. We would rather have that than submit. And, and it's, at times, when it comes to our walk and our relationship with the Lord, that's appropriate. That we don't submit to those laws that command us to do something that is not submitting to the Word of God. So we submit to the government at that point. But what, what is it? It's our calling to live in a way that is commendable before God. That's our responsibility. Again, as you read the book of Acts, you see how they responded to persecution. Just in my daily devotions this last couple of days, reading in, in Acts, you see that happening right up to the point, boy, when they when they came down, push came to shove, they would not submit to that. So what happened? Paul and Silas thrown into prison. What did they do in the midst of that? <laughs> there they were at midnight. What were they doing? Mm -hmm. Oh, I just can't believe they did this to us. Oh, this is awful. We have rights. I'm a Roman citizen. I'm gonna No, what did they do? They're there at midnight doing what? Mm -hmm. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. They're singing the praises of God to the point that the whole building is shaken and something happens as a result. Of why? Because of the example. It was pleasing to the Lord what they were doing. They were in submission, even to the point of being beaten for their faith. So we see that all the way, beginning in Acts, all the way through. When you see the early church, what's it doing? Submitting to God, but not to the authority of man when it comes against the word of God. It's our calling to be people that are represented. See, we're in a kingdom. We've been called into the kingdom of God, a kingdom that is not of this world. It's a kingdom that's from heaven. It's his kingdom. And so as a citizen of that kingdom, first of all and foremost, we submit to the Lord. And in doing so, we're an example to the other people of what it is to be governed by God. That was the whole purpose of Israel. They were to be the people that was to show the nations what it means to be governed by God, to live lives so that the Gentiles all the way through the Old Testament, predicted that they would come. But what did they do? They resisted that to the point of shutting themselves off completely so that they would not have anything to do with anyone else. But we're in the world, are we not? Not of the world. So what do we do in the midst of that? We live lives that are pleasing to the Lord. So because of our calling and now because of our conversation, look at verse number 25. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseers of your overseer of your souls. So what do we do? That's our con, our conversion. We have we have come to the Lord. He has done a work in our hearts and lives, and we have been changed by the power of God. So what is that to us? It is submission in our calling and also in our conversion, so that people see the difference in our lives. But he also talks about in verse in chapter three, verses one through seven, about our family obligations. Now again, this is a broad thing. We're going to get into this in great detail, but I just want us to see what Peter is doing. He is laying a foundation for us to build our lives upon in the midst of a crooked and generate a crooked and perverse generation, among whom we shine, as the scripture says, as stars, so that people see the glory of God in us and they give glory to God for that. So what about our family obligations? To the wife, there are certain things that Peter says that the wife is supposed to do. How do you like that, ladies? Is that good? Right, okay. 
Because why? Because the woman is the heart of the home. And, and so she is to be submissive to the Lord. But also the husband is supposed to be submissive to the Lord. We could go to Colossians and we could go to Ephesians chapter 5. And there you find out what Paul is saying to us about how we are to live. Husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. But we like the submission part, men. But we, you know, I am man, you are woman. So good to be a woman. We like that part, guys. But we don't necessarily get off too much on the part as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. How are husbands to love their wives? Like Jesus loved us. That's a lesson that we need, amen? Well, I thought I would just get a lot of amens from the wives on that one. But anyway, it's, it's true nonetheless. As husbands, we are, we are to be submissive in our fellowship obligations. That means our relationship to one another. How we conduct ourselves in the house of God in terms of our fellowship with one another. In our conversation, verse 10, he talks about we are to be submissive to the Lord in the things that we say. So that our conversation is pleasing not only to the people that we are, are in interaction with, but to the Lord primarily. So that when God sees our conversation, hears what we say then it's pleasing to the Lord. We're not talking about all kinds of foolishness and, and perverse things or things that are immoral or those kinds of things. No, but the, the words that are coming from our mouths are words that are pleasing to the Lord. That's how our conversation is to be. Not only that, but our character. Oh man, this is so important in verses 11 through 13 because what Paul does, for example, and Jesus does it, Peter does it as well, talks about our character, that which we are, who we are, and that results in our conduct. And so what is our conduct to be like? Well, it's to be, Paul tells us in, in 1 Thessalonians, above reproach. Is our conduct above reproach? Are we living in a way so that no accusation could ever even be brought against us? Of ungodly behavior, of immoral behavior, of all kinds of things of that nature? No. Each of these things calls for a deliberate action on our part. When we live like this, it's because we make a choice to live that way. It's a choice that we make daily. And, and how do we know what to do? Well, listen, it's all right here. It tells us what, so why, do you, why should we say we need to spend time in the Word of God? Because, dear friends, it is our, uh, our, our behavior manual, if you will. It's the, the Bible is our the, the, the manual of, of behavior that we, I love this, this little acronym that has been, acrostic that has been made out of the Bible. Basic instructions before leaving earth. Instructions about what? How to live. What we build the foundation out of, what the, build, the, the foundation is made up of, what we build upon, how we build in relationship to one another. Because we are the temple, the habitation of God through the Spirit. How does it look like in terms of our building with one another? So does the world look at us and see a bunch of hypocrites because we're not doing what we say we are supposed to do? Not live. Sometimes the world knows better how to, we ought to live than we do. But we do need to have that basic instruction so that we can build this, this habitation of God through the Spirit. Uh, and, and let me just add that when it talks about these things, when Peter talks about these things, or when Paul talks about these things, none of it is optional. There is a tense in the, in the original language called the imperative. And it's a command. It's not a suggestion. Just like the Ten Commandments are not called the Ten Suggestions. But sometimes we treat them like that. Why is that? Because we don't like to submit. When Jesus takes it to another level, when, when man says, don't, uh, don't lie, Jesus says, well, look, it, it, it goes beyond that. Don't lust. Well, he says, if you've looked with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. So it's just that level of, of behavior that is raised in the New Testament in the words that Jesus spoke, in the words that Paul and Peter and the rest of the apostles spoke, it's a new level of commitment and, and, and behavior that is, is commanded of us. It's not like we get to vote on whether we can do that or not. What do we do when God's word says, don't lie? Well, I, you know, I, it's just a white lie. I, I love this concept. Truth intended to deceive is still a lie. I wrote a great illustration about that years ago. I've used this many, many times. 
This is a great illustration. The first mate of the sailing ship wrote in his book, in his journal they kept of their voyage, the captain was sober again today. What's the implication of that? He hadn't been a lot. He so, hadn't been sober any day. But it was a lie because the captain was sober every day. But when, the, when his journal was turned in to the owners of the shipping line, his behavior became suspect because of what? Because truth was given that was intended to deceive. It's still a lie. And so we have to be really careful about that, don't we? That we don't tell the truth, but there's something hidden. Why, why do we do that? Because there's something in us that doesn't want something exposed. Our lack of submission in a particular area. So we cover that by telling the truth, but it's intended to deceive. So it's so important. So all of these things, once again, they're not optional. There are things that God commands us in his word. Grace in submission. Now, grace in suffering. He talks about in chapter 3, verse 13 through chapter 4, verse 19. Peter explains this grace in suffering by showing us six things. I didn't write these in your notes, but you can write them down. Uh, first of all, grace in suffering, or suffering that is experienced in chapter 3, verse 14 through 17. Experience. 13, 14 through 17. Bunch of E's here. Exemplify. Exemplify. Expected. Explain. Expanded. And examine. He gives us all of those things there in these verses. And it's just important that we understand that in the midst of suffering, we to experience the grace of God in those things by being obedient to the word of God. If we are doing that, then when those things come to us, when, when suffering or when persecution comes, grace from God is there to stand in the midst of that. As Paul said in the reading that we read to at our scripture reading today, having done everything to stand, what should we do then? Stand. 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 How do you do that? We do that in the grace of God. So Peter concludes this matter of suffering, exhorting the Christians to remember that though they walk in honesty and in faithfulness to God, not living like the Gentiles or the non-Christians do. And all the biblical writers, I might add, say the same thing. You are to no longer live like the Gentiles do, but you are to return good for evil. This is the whole idea. We're not to be concerned about our own satisfaction or about our own rights. We are to live in a time when people are, are, are so concerned about that, but we are to live differently than that. It's the spirit of the age that says, I have a right. How many rights do we have as Christians? Mm -hmm. That's not 30. 3 -oh. It's zero. Because why? What do we do? We submit to God and give up all of our rights. My right to be right. My right to defend myself. My right to be this or to be that. We submit that to God and allow him then to give us the freedom to act in the way that is pleasing to him. And you know, people say, well, you Christians, that's just, you guys are under God's thumb. And he no, it's the exact opposite of that. We have a freedom that the world doesn't understand or even really know about. Because why? Because God has set us free from the chains of bondage that we experience living for the devil. Now we are free from those things. And so... We are not to live in that same spirit that the world lives in, but to have uh, an example of what it is to be a Christian. We have been taught in Christ that we are to operate on a different level than the world does. Uh, uh, well, I think of Jesus in Philippians chapter 2. He is our example. What did, what did Paul say about that? He did all of these things and submitted himself even to the point of death, death on the cross. And so how are we to live? We are to submit in like manner. We return good for evil. Sometimes that's difficult, isn't it? Because if someone hits you upside the head, our natural reaction is to return that. But you know, it's not, it's not in us to give blow for blow on an equal level, is it? The goal is not uh, to get even. The goal is to get ahead. If you hit me, 
I'm going to hit you harder. Isn't that what's in our heart? Really? Honest? Come on. Isn't that true? Yes. That's what's it. Because we don't want to submit. We want to return more for what's been given to us. If you do me dirt, I'm going to dirt, I'm going to do dirt back to you. But God's called us to live a life that's different. Jesus talks about that very clearly on the sermon, in the sermon on the Mount about how we are to respond to the evildoers. It's just important that we understand. And, and so we have to remember who this letter was written to. He's written this letter to people who are under intense persecution. And so how are they to live? Not returning evil for evil, but returning good for evil. When the soldier tells you to carry his stuff a mile, Jesus says, what were they to do? Carry it too. If the guy asks you for a coat, you give him your cloak also. I mean, it's just, it, it's going beyond giving more evil for evil. It's giving good more for the evil that has been done to us. And that's the example that we have of how we are to live. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. People who are undergoing severe persecution and real punishment. God's program for them in the age that they lived in was that they would return good for evil. Mm. It may not be all that impressive to the eyes of the world for you and I to be servants. Jesus said, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, what do you have to do? You have to become a servant of all. Wouldn't we rather be served than served? <coughs> Honest. Somebody says, oh, I just love serving. Mm. I'm a little suspicious at that point of you, because we we want and you have to think about it in terms of the, the culture of the time that they lived in. Just think about this, for example. You're walking the dusty roads, and you, as a servant, get to do what when people come? Mm. You get to wash their dirty feet. <laughs> Yay! Not many people sign up for that. I would rather have somebody wash my feet than me wash theirs. <laughs> no, just thinking about that, I remember back, uh, we announced one, uh, one service, I remember this particular one, we're going to have a foot washing service. Have, have you ever had one of those, seen one of those done? A few of us. What, what did everybody do before they came to church? <laughs> They washed their wash feet. Them. <laughs> I was like, that was just so funny, you know, because but they didn't do that then. They literally had to wash the dirt off of their feet. And it wasn't a high calling. It was the calling of what? What kind of a person? A servant. One who was in submission, who saw themselves and experienced that thing. So that everything, that in everything, God may be glorified through what we do. That's the goal. That's the purpose of it. Quickly, let me just finish up. God's grace in shepherding. Rules for shepherds. Here's what they are. Five things. It speaks of their maturity. And, you know, I, I, I'm, it's just there in your notes. I'm not going to spend time going into each one. But maturity, ministry, motivation, manner, the magnificence of the whole thing. As, as men or uh, people who are called to be shepherds, there is a glory that is, I wonder that is there. Then there are rules for sheep in verses 5 through 7. Of chapter 5. And the thing I see in all of these things is humility is required. You have to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. For people who don't like submitting, is that a, a, a difficult thing? You bet it is. But it's required. And the thing about that I see is, is important about it. It's reasonable. When you look at the Word of God and you see the things that are going on there and you understand what God is, when you know where you were and where you have come from and you understand the grace that that was extended to bring us into the kingdom of God to, from where we were, then it's reasonable that we would submit ourselves. But the wonder of it and the glory of the whole thing is it's rewarding. God will record, re reward us for those things that we've done. Now, but the, but the glory, I think, and the wonder of that is when we get to heaven and all of the things that are passed out for the rewards that we've done, what do we do with those things? <laughs> Give them back. We lay them at the feet of Jesus because we understand it wasn't anything in me that caused that to happen. It's none of me. It's all of him. And the only reasonable response is to give it back to him, that he would be glorified. Praise the Lord. Amen. Then Peter gives reasons for steadfastness, and that's part of the reason why I had uh, 
Ephesians chapter 5 or 6 read to us about the warfare that we are in. We should be watching for the roaring lion in verse in uh, Ephesians chapter, or in, excuse me, in, in uh, 1 Peter, in verse 8, chapter 5, verse 8. We should be warring with the lion, he says to us in chapter 5, verse 9. Ephesians chapter uh, 6, we read, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. That's what we need today to be able to fight against the devil. Do you realize, do you know this morning that you're in a war? That when you said yes to Jesus, you were conducted into the army of God, drafted into his army. We are in a battle today. What is the battle about? It's a battle for the souls of men. Yes. Jesus put you and me here in the place that we are in, knowing him for a specific purpose. There are people that you will come in contact with in your life that I personally will never even meet, won't even know them. How are they going to know about Jesus? Sometimes I think our concept of evangelism is that we, we bring them to church, let the pastor preach to them, and they'll get saved or something like that. Who are the ministers of this church? I'm one of them, but we all are. Ephesians chapter 4 he gave some to the apostles and prophets, pastors, or apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to do what? To equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So who does the work of the ministry? All of us. So wherever we are, we are to be witnesses. Go into all the world, Paul said, or Jesus said in, in Acts chapter 1, go into all the world, preach the gospel. That's what we're supposed to do. And that, and that, that responsibility for touching the lives, making an impact in the world is upon you and upon me. And so we are to do that because, well, as I said, we have enlisted in the army of the Lord. And so we must do battle with the enemy of our soul. And you know, he, he tries every day in every way in each and every one of our lives to get us to submit to him rather than to submit to the Lord. What did he want Jesus to do? Remember when mm. Jesus was tempted? To, I'll give you all this if you'll worship me. Because he said, I'm going to be like God. I will ascend. I will be like the Most High. That was his aspiration. But God, obviously greater because Satan, Lucifer is a created being. God is forever and eternal. So, but we're in this warfare. First Corinthians chapter, Second Corinthians chapter 10. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. This is a different kind of battle. How do we fight this battle? On our knees. That's how we win that battle. By fighting on our knees, we have to be willing to overcome the enemy, submit to God, and he will flee from us, Peter tells us. So important. Peter concludes this epistle with, with exhortation, with explanation. Uh, in chapter 5, verse 12 through 14, let me just read that if you turn there. If you, or first Peter chapter 5, verse number 12, beginning there. By Sylvanus, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son, greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. We are a chosen generation, a royal priest of the holy nation, his own special people. For what purpose? that we might show forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Praise God. There's really nothing that you or I can contribute to any of this. That's one of the things that I love about it. It isn't about how good you are, how bad I'm not, or you are, whatever. None of those things. Really, what, what is there that you could offer to God that it would benefit his kingdom? Mm. <laughs> not a thing. Not a thing. But Peter tells us that we have a special place and a specific, a specific purpose. We've been called, I think of Esther, been called to the kingdom for such an hour as this. You and I have been called to the kingdom of God for this hour, for this time, for this place. What is it that God wants of you? What is it that he expects of us? But by being in his kingdom, a kingdom of kings and priests, we are offering a sacrifice to God that is like a sweet-smelling aroma to him by our service, by our conversation, by our conduct, all of these things. And I pray that in your life 
and in my life, that that will be an integral part of everything that we do. As we together submit ourselves to the Lord in this time that we are living in, so that the beauty of Jesus Christ will be seen in your life and in mine, and people will be drawn to the Christ that we love and serve. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Well, I pray my life will be like that. That we together as a community will be a light shining like a city set on a hill. That the world will see the goodness and the grace of God in and through our lives. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you this morning for the grace that you have given to us. Grace to submit to you in, in, in saying yes, Lord, and submitting to you in times of suffering. Uh, no matter who we are, whether we are... Uh, in the pulpit or the pew, we are submitted one to another because the ground of the Father is all level at the foot of the cross. And we are submitted to one another. And people people see the love of Jesus and say, how we love one another. May that be true of us, Lord. May we truly love as you love. That the grace of God that has been extended to us will be extended from us to one another. And as we are engaged in this this incredible warfare with the enemy of our souls. I pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us to submit to you and realize that the battle is not ours, but is the Lord's. Yes. Yes, thank you for that and the victory that we have through Jesus Christ. And it's in your name, Lord Jesus, that we pray. What's that? Amen. Amen.